ओम ज्ञान चिरंजन शलाका So we'll start off by asking you to join us in chanting Hare Krishna for a few minutes. Would you all like to do that? Okay, so it's very simple. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I I will sing Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare and then after that all together we please sing Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Humanitarian organizations purport to help us the intention to help others is certainly laudable it's certainly better than the intention to torture others kill them blow them up exploit them or in various other ways cause harm to them certainly every uh, noble human being should desire the welfare of others The well-known Vedic injunction is "Sarve Sukhino Bhavantu." Let everyone be happy. Of course, it requires some knowledge of how to make others happy or how to benefit them. In the last three and a half years or so, the word "tsunami" has become famous. But the tsunami of 2004 was it? that was of that wasn't the first one in history the word tsunami is there it's a japanese word which got incorporated into english because they uh, really they experienced it enough times to have a word for it in their language japanese yeah it's a japanese word. i spent many years in bangladesh which is also a center for international aid although i couldn't help but notice that most of the welfare organizations had an office in dhaka and not much else in the capital they had an office in the capital city and not much else that's all anyway uh, in 1970 71 that was the time of the so called bangladesh war of, of independence and there was a tremendous amount of suffering in Hello. that and shortly after that there was a massive tidal bore in the southern districts they called it a tidal bore nowadays we call it a tsunami tidal wave or tidal bore which uh, at a stroke because bangladesh is a flat country so that just came in from miles and miles in land and killed who knows how many people so uh, so many welfare organizations in the western countries they immediately mobilized and one of the things they did was they collected lots of old clothes to send out to mm-hmm. people who lost or survived but who have lost everything uh, the people who survived lost everything except the clothes they were wearing and so huge container loads of um, western dresses started coming but the women of Bangladesh don't wear western dresses they wear saris and they didn't want to start wearing western dresses so that is just an example of an intention to help but due to lack of knowledge it was a useless in them or some useful things like uh, blankets they also did but due to the uh, prevailing corruption in the country all the blankets got exported to india and sold there the uh, we f- we find in what they call these undeveloped countries that these disasters are a very good opportunity for the rich people to get richer i not sure what the situation is here but i suspect it may be similar also millions of dollars pour into the country and the poor people remain as poor as ever anyway the point i'm making here is that uh, if we wish to help others first we have to know how we can actually help them so uh it would be considered that we can help people by providing schools and hospitals and houses and roads 
and all the basic facilities for human learning. So that will help people. So our Christian Conscious Movement is also a welfare organization. But people often challenge us that what welfare work are you doing? You're just singing Hare Krishna and speaking from Bhagavad Gita and how is that helping others? But actually if we understand the truth expounded in Bhagavad Gita, you'll understand that this is the best welfare work. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, his first instruction to the lamenting Arjuna is to distinguish between the body and the soul. Arjuna was lamenting that uh, so many people will have to die here. But Bhagavan Krishna pointed out that, well, even if, they, even if they were not to die here, everyone has to die anyway. It's just like in the tsunami, so many people died. But if they hadn't died in the tsunami, they would have died anyway. So we can't protect people from death, ultimately. But in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna teaches that yang yang bhavam swaram bhavam tajyante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kauntaya sadhata bhavam bhavitaha. So according to the consciousness we cultivate in this life, that determines our future. So the real disaster of the tsunami was not that so many people died, but that they died without cultivating higher consciousness. And the same disaster is going on moment by moment throughout the world. Because human life is meant for cultivating higher consciousness. Urdhvanga chanti sattvasta madde chishtanti rajasa at the present time, uh, modern civilization is promoting the lower consciousness you know, uh, of Rajaguru and Tamaguru, which causes people to get born in the lower species of life. So, uh, of course, to have the infrastructure of roads, hospitals, schools, houses, this is required. But that is not all in all. Even the animals, they make some infrastructure for their living. The bees are very expert, engineers, very good social organization. There's no factions in bee society. There's perfect uh, cooperation. So in terms of social cooperation and peaceful coexistence, we can learn a lot from the bees. In many ways, you could say the bees are better than the human. But still, human life is more important than bee life. Because in human life, we can cultivate higher consciousness. Okay. The bees, the birds, the animals, they have uh, elaborate arrangements, but only for eating, sleeping, mating, and living. So in human society, if we think that simply to make arrangements for eating, sleeping, mating and defending, our job is complete, then we are no better than animals. Dharmo hitesham adhiko visheisham, the special facility in human life which is not there in animal life is the possibility to practice dharma. So animals eat, sleep, mate and defend. Human beings eat, sleep, mate and defend. But a human being is not simply someone with two legs and two hands who speaks Tamil or Simala or English. But real human being is one who practices dharma. So animal plus dharma equals human being. So by simple arithmetic, if A plus B equals C, then C minus B equals A, so, a uh, human being minus dharma equals animal. Dharma hina pashubhya Human being without dharma is simply an animal. So most people think, yes, I'm following dharma. I'm a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, a Buddhist, or something like that. But mostly we find that for people who go to the church, the temple, the mosque, or whatever, and they simply pray to God, for facilities for eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. They're praying to God, please make me a happy animal. But real dharma begins with 
Atato Brahma Jignasa to inquire into the ultimate reality. Dharma is not simply some sentimental or dogmatic uh, endeavor. Dharma means the endeavor to understand who am I, why am I suffering, what is my position in eternity. So as I was saying, Bhagavan Krishna began his teachings to Arjuna by uh, delineating the difference between the soul and the body. Without understanding this, there is no adhyatmic, there's no actual spiritual understanding. To practice uh, religious life with the idea of enjoying the body or getting facilities for personal enjoyment is not actually spiritual. We are eternal beings. We are not, we never actually are born or done. But due to a hunger or attachment to the idea that I should enjoy it myself, we take the various bodies which do not, they're not actually us. So real uh, benefit for the human being is to give knowledge of the real self of the soul. Indriyani prani aho indriye hyo param manaha manasas tu para buddhe yo buddhe paratas tu saha. So there are various levels of understanding who we are. Our grossest needs are our sensual needs. We need food, clothing, and shelter. So it is certainly a humanitarian activity to endeavor to provide these for persons who are lacking these basic amenities. However, this is not the total need of the human being. There are mental requirements also, and intellectual requirements. This, uh, there's the whole range of emotions to be considered. Uh, in the prison, someone may be in solitary confinement. They have food, clothing, and shelter. But it is a punishment because they are deprived of intercourse with other human beings. So there are emotional needs also. That is more difficult to provide because it's more subtle, it's less tangible. If people are suffering from hunger, it's relatively easy to solve that problem by providing food. But if people are suffering from emotional deprivation, and that no one loves them, or they're being mistreated, uh, then it's more difficult to rectify that situation. By giving a hundred dollars, you can maybe provide, I don't know, 200 kilos of rice or something like that. But even if you give a billion dollars, you can't give one drop of love. <laughs> so these are also human requirements. And practically speaking, we see that many people who have all the food, clothing, shelter, and plenty of money, they're often completely miserable. Whereas we find people who are struggling, they don't even have proper food, clothing, and shelter, but they're actually much more emotionally balanced and happy because they have bonding among themselves, the parents care for their children, and which often in the rich families they don't do. So although the uh, many welfare organizations from the Western countries are very anxious to provide uh, humanitarian aid for <laughs> what they call less developed countries, uh, they also need some aid themselves. I mean, there's, they're suffering from emotional love. That's why we find in the Western countries, even though there's so much money, there's also so much suicide and so much serious mental illness. If you go to America, you'll find there's a common word everyone knows, Prozac. Who's heard of Prozac? It's an antidepressant drug. So many people take it that everyone knows the word. Just like who here has heard of Idlis? Who knows what an Idli is? Everyone. Who ate Idlis for breakfast today? Anyone? No, they all eat cornflakes nowadays, or what? No, no, no. They're too big. 
Oh, is it? We know what it really is, right? Okay. So it's like that. If you say, uh, I ate idlis today, you don't have to explain. You know, everyone knows what an idli is. So in the same way in America, if you say to someone, uh, I'm on Prozac, you don't have to explain what it is. Everyone knows what it is. It's so common. It's a, for people who have serious, regular depression, which I don't even know if there's a word in ordinary Tamil for that. There's, it means a state of just feeling that the whole world is useless and, and a complete self, a sense of hopelessness. I, ju- I don't think there's any words for this in Indian yeah, languages. Yeah, there's no, no, because it's just not no. common. Depression, it means uh, vishada is a Sanskrit word. I don't know what it means. Shokam. Maha Shokam. A few words. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. You see, there's, there's no, what to speak of the medicine, there's not even a word for the condition. So anyway, we're discussing human beings have uh, gross sensual needs, they have emotional needs, they have intellectual needs. The cow eats grass and gives milk. The cow doesn't conduct research into varieties of grass and how the grass is transformed into milk. The cow doesn't care. Nor does the pasu have the uh, intellectual capacity to conduct scientific research. But human beings are curious beings. They want to know why, how, who, where, what, when. And based on trying to find the answers to these questions, all these studies of history, geography, science, sociology, they've all developed. So humans have uh, sensual, emotional, and intellectual needs, but the ultimate need is the spiritual need. Because uh, ultimately we are spiritual beings. And even if there's all uh, facilities for fulfilling our sensual, emotional, and intellectual needs, still we feel we are lacking something. And that something which is missing is the vital factor of our existence. Because ultimately we are all spiritual beings. We all have our eternal spiritual relationship with Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. This material existence is unnatural for us. Why is there so much suffering in the world? It is an unnatural situation for us. There is the example of the fish out of water. If you take a fish out of water and you give him uh, a glass of beer, a packet of cigarettes, TV, or if you give him to be his girlfriend the most beautiful fish, she fish, this fish, the, the, the world's most beautiful fish, as his girl, lady fish. It doesn't matter what you give him, he cannot be satisfied because he's in an unnatural situation. So in the same way, we are in an unnatural situation in this material world. We don't want to die, we don't want to have disease, we don't have any kind of distress, but these things are forced upon us. However much we try to live peacefully and happily, we are forced to die. And jatasya hi dhruva mrityo We have to die ultimately. We're not meant for Andruvam Janma Mritasya. Punarapi Dhanadam, Punarapi Maranam, Punarapi Janani Jaktare Shayanam. This is material existence. But we are meant for happy existence. There is the spiritual world that is called Vaikuntha or Golo. There is no birth, death, old age, or disease there. That is our position of actual blissful existence. So this Krishna conscious woman is giving knowledge of the spiritual world and how to go there. If we have this knowledge and if we act on that knowledge by performing bhakti, then all our problems will be solved. But if we don't uh, make the endeavor to go to the spiritual world, then 
whatever endeavors we make, we, we cannot actually solve our problems at all. We think, well, the tsunami, that's something very bad. It is. But it's not really the problem, it's the symptom of the problem. The real problem is that we are denying our spiritual existence. And therefore, we have to remain in material existence. And material existence means birth, death, old age and disease. And wars, and torture, and tsunamis, and famines, and so on, and so on, and so on. So by giving this knowledge of spiritual existence, this Krishna conscious movement is actually performing the greatest welfare work for human society. Whereas other attempts to help others are paltry at best. Paltry means insignificant. Very small. It's just like if someone is uh, sentenced to death, tomorrow you will be shot. And different people come in to help him and say, well, we will get you a better bed in your cell so you can sleep more comfortably. And uh, we'll make sure you have a very good meal. And we'll remove this old fan and put a new air conditioning system in your cell. And we'll arrange that you'll get shot with gold bullets. We'll arrange for you to be shot with gold bullets. Bullets made of gold. 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 Sona. Uh, your foot. You'll be shot with a bullet made of gold. So, will it help the person? Someone else is getting shot and he'll say, Ha ha, you're getting shot with bullets made of lead. I'm getting shot with bullets made of gold. <laughs> So the real thing he wants is a, is a lawyer to get an appeal and get him free from the death sentence. So in the same way, uh, we're making facilities to live comfortably, but we can't live. But the real thing is to uh, give the consciousness by which we can get freed from repeated birth and death. And the process is very simple. In this Kali Yuga, Simply by chanting the names of Krishna, we can attain all spiritual perfection. Actually, this tsunami and wars and torture, it's, it's typical of Kali Yuga. In Srimad Bhagavatam, there is, a, it was written 5,000 years ago, it predicts the situation in Kali Yuga. One of the prominent symptoms is Vrita Himsa, meaningless violence. For no, there's just so much violence and nothing, there's no tangible effect or no reason, it just, it just goes on and on and on and no one is going to. That's only one thing. Kali Yuga is an ocean of thoughts. So this is our humanitarian offering how people can uh, cross over all miseries by chanting Hare Of course, we're not totally indifferent to the situation in this world because we are in it. So we're not saying that schools, hospitals and everything else should be stopped. But we're saying that if we really want to help others, we have to expand our vista of understanding what are the needs of others. Another consideration is that if we are to help others in the best way, then first of all, we have to prepare ourselves. If someone thinks, I want to help others, I'll, be, uh, I'll do free surgery for poor people. Well, first he has to learn to be a surgeon. Good wishes are not enough. If you go with a, you know, a, a surgeon's knife and say, yes, I'm going to get free operations, and uh, do you... Are you a doctor? No, but I really want to help you. And now you just have to cut and, you know, stick the knife in and people say, I, you know, I'll die from heart attack. I'd rather die from heart attack than die from, than your, than your so-called surgeon. So in the same way, there are many people who purport to uh, be spiritual leaders. But they themselves are not trained in the systematic knowledge of Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. They neither practice spiritual life in the proper way, nor have they any knowledge of what actual spiritual life is. 
So in the name of being spiritual teachers, they just promote themselves as Bhagavan, or in this way they do some ridiculous things which uh, foolish people are impressed by, but which actually causes more harm than good. So, uh, you know, if, if we realize we need some medical help, we better find a, a proper doctor. Someone may call himself a doctor, but then if he doesn't act according to Bhagavad Gita, then he's not actually a doctor. So, there's a few thoughts about spiritual humanitarian work. Actually, our work is not humanitarian, it's sarve sukhino bhavanti, that all living beings be happy. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, sarva bhuta hite ratam, one should be attached to the welfare of all living beings. So we may think we'll benefit human beings by starting a poultry farm, but uh, the chickens, they're not very, they're not very pleased with it. The Vedic understanding is that if we unnecessarily kill animals or human beings or whatever, then we have to suffer a karmic reaction. But generally, you see, it's a symptom of low consciousness to want to eat meat. When uh, the human body can be sustained very well without eating meat. And therefore, we interpret the scriptures in various ways. Lord Buddha taught, Ahimsa Paramo Bhavana. So actually, Buddhists should be vegetarians. Because by purchasing meat, they're encouraging the butchers. But I was in Thailand and I sometimes used to ask Buddhist people that if you're a Buddhist, how are you eating meat? So we don't kill the animals, the butcher kills. But they're encouraging him and they share in the sinful reaction. They share in the sinful reaction to doing so. So in Bhagavad Gita it's discussed about Sattvagun, Rajagun, Tamagun. So, uh, certain religious paths, they uh, appeal to people in Sattvagun, some appeal to people in Rajagun, and some, people, some appeal to people in Tamagun. But we can't expect that we'll get the same result from acting in Tamagun that we'll get from acting in Sattvagun. <laughs> Even the human society works in God for a long time. See why there is no peacefulness in human society. Well, I just gave the answer. That if we act in Tamagun, we can say God, 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 but we're still in our consciousness. In the war, both sides are praying to God to help us. In the war, both armies, the members are praying to God to help them. But in most cases, both sides are wrong, and why should God help either of them? We want God to serve us, but we are meant to serve what He wants. If we simply thought what God wants us to do, instead of praying to God, that you help me to do what I want to do, then we would have actual religion. We say people are praying to God, but most people are not even interested to know who is God. Mostly people have a very vague idea of God because they're not actually interested to understand who He is. They just want to get something from Him. They don't really want to serve Him. So this kind of religion, that leads to more division. Due to lack of knowledge of the actual purpose of religion, people, they, uh, they torture and kill others in the name of religion. Oh, that's very right. nice. Yeah. Actually, I was saying we should have pictures of Krishna, Radha, Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Otherwise, people think we're another, just a guru cult, you know? Yeah. This is a picture of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who comes in a parampara of bona fide gurus, who uh, taught this process of Krishna Bhakti all over the world and gave uh, even persons like myself with absolutely no background of Vedic culture the opportunity to chant Hare Krishna. Do we have the proper book here? We have many books written by Srila Prabhupada here. 
he wasn't uh, running a personality cult. He didn't go all over the world and tell people, worship me. You'll find mostly all these so-called holy people, they come and they say, worship me. Or they claim themselves to be God. But he said, according, he taught the conclusion of all Vedic scriptures that Krishna is Bhagavan, we should worship Krishna. He, that is the sign of a bona fide guru. Guru Bhava Hagavar Santi, Shishya Vita Bahalaka, Durlava Sankur Devi, Shishya Tapa Bahalaka. There are many, this is spoken by Lord Shiva to Devi Parvati. He says there are many gurus who are very expert in taking away the wealth of their disciples, but it's rare to find a genuine guru who can take away the suffering of their disciples. So I'm very grateful to Lord Krishna for having sent me such a guru who didn't cheat me. It's a question with some devotees, they ask that, by doing working to Lord Sri Krishna, does the guru summon Padre to keep in this birthday itself? Please address the question. Definitely we can. That depends on our own sincerity. If we call out Krishna, Krishna, but we're still looking at the material world, thinking I can enjoy it, then he won't get Krishna. Draupadi was calling out Govinda, Govinda, and holding on to a sari with one hand. When she let go of the sari and with two hands called out Govinda, Govinda, then Govinda came. So we can attain Krishna certainly. Next question is, uh, the question is that, how we can control our mental desires, material desires, how we can control our mental We cannot. Maya is very strong, we are very weak. But Maya By taking help from Krishna, who is stronger than Maya, we can overcome. By taking help from Krishna, we can become successful. By ourselves it's not possible. Even many great yogis who meditated with great austerities for thousands of years still couldn't control their minds. And we can't even keep our minds still for five seconds. Has anyone ever tried to sit and do meditation? And immediately... <laughs> That's why in Kali Yuga, the meditation is chanting Hare Krishna. That is practical. Of course, even while chanting, we can be chanting with the lips, and the mind is going... <laughs> But the uh, sound is directed toward Krishna, and Krishna will help us. We are very weak, tiny little beings. But Krishna, if we sincerely take shelter of Krishna, Krishna will certainly help us. Apart from that, I wrote one book called Brahmacharya and Krishna Consciousness. So this book is not just for Brahmacharis who are Brahmacharis, but for all persons desirous of advancing in spiritual life, in which controlling the mind and the senses is the basis. That's why again, you see this question of meat eating comes again. It's, uh, you see, if you eat such rajasic food, then how can the mind and senses be controlled? So, these things should be considered. You have that? We have it in English. Yes. And still, okay, Any more questions, a lot of questions, that's good. The question is that we are saying that when we are doing animals, uh, we eat the sin. And when we are eating vegetables also, naturally we are eating the sick thing. Yeah, well, actually, much vegetable, much vegetarian food does not involve killing. Just like eating rice. Well, do you kill the rice to eat it? No. Isn't it? The rice is cut after the plant has already died. Or fruit, when you take the, the mambala from the tree, it's you don't kill the tree. Although some things, they may be killed also. When you take the uh, spinach from the ground, then the spinach means the shark. Or the, the, that, then the, that plant may be killed. That, uh, the, the consciousness of the spinach plant is much less than that of a cow or a chicken. Therefore, it suffers much less. Therefore, it's less sinful reaction. But yes, there is also still sinful. 
Therefore, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna states, Yagya Shishtashira Santa, Mutchante Sarada Kilo Vishai, Dhunjante Te Tadam.